Um, so to quickly introduce um, our farm, uh, Sogan Valley Farm, uh, we were established in 2015 and we're in Cannon Falls, Minnesota, which is zone 4A. And we have uh, 12 acres in active uh, diversified vegetable crops on our 30 acres of land. And um, we are, uh, we've been certified organic from the start, although we've had uh, portions of our land in transition um, as we uh, as we expanded over the, the last five years. And our uh, vegetables are going uh, primarily to uh, our customizable CSA program. And uh, we grow about three acres of peppers. That's our, our primary wholesale crop. Um, so uh, I'll start by just giving a little bit of context um, about my, my background with reduced tillage and what its role is on our farm right now. Um, my, my background, uh, my experience with reduced tillage started about maybe seven years ago uh, in graduate school, actually. Um, I had been um, managing a production on a, a CSA farm and, and I, I had learned about the system, the organic no-till system they were using at the Rodale Institute. Uh, Jeff Moyer wrote a, a book about it and, and got, you know, overnight got really excited about it. And uh, as it turned out, my, uh, my wife and I were, were moving down to, uh, to Iowa to, for her graduate program. And I ended up uh, being able to, to get into a, a master's program myself. So I, I spent two years doing some, um, a field experiment using uh, like in the, the in-situ cover crop mulch system that, that Jan described at the beginning of his talk. Um, and, uh, and we were actually laying the groundwork for starting this farm while, uh, while I was still in grad school. And, um, and when we transitioned into this, we, um, we, we weren't really ready to, to try to apply that system across the board. Um, as, um, you know, there are several challenges that have been, and, uh, and I'll, I'll describe some additional ones. Um, but, um, so we, we do predominantly use, uh, uh, pretty traditional tillage methods, although um, I like to think I'm, I'm as conscientious about it as I as I can be. Um, but we've maintained uh, an experimental aspect with reduced tillage, and it's still something that uh, I spend a good a good deal of time uh, thinking about. And uh, and most years that we've been farming, we've had some kind of a, a trial um, going on, and and those will will continue until you know we hope to find something that is um, we feel works well both on our, our scale and with our level of crop diversity and, and succession cropping. Um, and, you know, we, we do hope to, to try to maintain uh, profitability uh, during this process and uh, maintain a good quality of life. And, you know, that's, it's, it's a, it can, it can be a little bit of a trade-off because as Ellen mentioned, there's a lot of pre-planning. Um, it's a little bit more complicated to try to manage uh, crops with these no-till systems um, so I'm going to, yeah, spend the next 15 minutes or so going over some of the systems that, that we've worked and worked with and, uh, and what we've learned from them. Uh, so yeah, first is this uh, in-situ cover crop mulch system um, around here commonly uh, using winter rye or cereal rye planted in the fall and uh, killed with the roller crimper or a flail mower when it reaches anthesis. Um, and then a, a cash crop can be planted through that mulch. Um, afterwards, and, and this is the area that I worked with in my uh, my grad school research, and um, we looked at both a, a no-till uh, planted system, and and Jan actually made the distinction. He called it rotational no-till, um, which I think is for for most folks is probably a more accurate term. Uh, it sounds like what um, Ellen and, and folks are trying to do at a starter farm really is more true no-till, uh, where you know even perennial weeds you know just get dug out by hand, but um, often there's going to be a, you know, some, some degree of tillage, you know, if, if for no other reason than to establish the cover crop prior um, and incorporate residue. So um, that's how we set up this system. And we looked at both uh, no-till uh, planting and strip-till planting, which uh, you see in the middle photo here. Um, and the idea there being that we can concentrate uh, tillage just in the crop row where the crop can, can benefit more from the um, the soil warming uh, and aeration aspects that you get from tillage. And, um, but we still maintain good, good residue cover over the majority of the field. Uh, and 
Yeah, in 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 practice, uh, I've found that that really can lead to just challenges with with weed management with with these systems. Whenever you have exposed soil, um, it can be trouble because uh, it's you know difficult to impossible to use any kind of mechanical cultivation uh, to control weeds. And um, you know, I, I suspect I'm not alone in saying that I, I have a few weed seeds in my in my soil. Um, so I'm just going to share a, a few of the, the things that, that were take-homes from me, kind of practical considerations if you're uh, thinking about trying this system on your farm. Um, it's, it's really suited you, using winter rye, which is the, the most widely used and, and probably most reliable cover crop uh, to use for a, a killed mulch like this. Um, they can work well for crops that are planted like, once per season and with a good planting date in early June, at least in, in, in Minnesota, upper Midwest here, would be about the right time. So early, early crops, late crops, and crops that have like lots of successions throughout the season would need a different or a modified system. And uh, a uniform and high biomass cover crop uh, is essential. I think Jan said a perfect cover crop. So um, if, if you are coming in with a kind of a, a sparse uh, or a late planted cover crop or you seeded and it, it didn't get any rain for the first month and it only germinated in, in late October, um, it's probably not gonna, not gonna work in this situation. Uh, and really increasingly, I'm feeling like the sup having some way to supplement mulch is a pretty key, uh, a, a key for, for having this be a, a versatile system on a, on a farm. Um, of our scale. And so whether that be a, a transferred cover crop biomass, um, like, like Jan discussed, uh, or simply some kind of other um, straw or other baled biomass that can be distributed onto the field, I think um, would increase the chances of, of success kind of year to year with this. Um, and then, you know, the, the method for, for getting transplants into the ground uh, and soil amendments without disturbing the mulch, I think can be a key challenge for, for, for many, many folks in our situation. And um, that the mulch tech planter that, that Jan discussed is, uh, I mean, I've, I've spent a good deal of time uh, watching videos and, and corresponding with, with Johannes about that. It's, it really does like totally solve, solve the problem of, uh, you know, being able to have a, a heavy mulch on the soil surface and, so you can have good weed suppression, but still be able to, to both get fertilizer and transplants through there and have it close up tight without leaving exposed soil. Um, and for the record, I, they, they are willing to ship to the U.S. Um, so they, they have worked it out so they can, they can, they can send it here if, if someone wanted to buy it. But it is a, a very expensive machine. Um, you know, so it's, I think, a three-row unit was uh, somewhere north of $45,000. Um, I think that did not include the fertilizer hopper, if I recall. Um, so, and then there's, there's freight on top of that. So it's likely going to be a little prohibitive for someone on our scale or on my scale, I'll just speak for myself, um, who is doing it kind of more on an experimental basis, um, but really amazing technology that I think has, could have a really important role in the future of, of trying to get this system applied more widely. Um, and then lastly, um, just the, you know, cool, cool climates, um, and, and heavy soils, short growing seasons, um, you're more likely to have, uh, challenges with, uh, with this system because of that mulch and the, and the, uh, both nutrient and temperature related, uh, um, limitations. So, um, with those in mind, um, I've spent a lot of time trying to think of ways to modify the system to address some of those and, and maybe make them better suited for, for our, our climate. And um, so we did a, a trial with this system here. Um, the, the cover crop was the, planted in 2019. And last year we, we grew um, a few vegetable crops in there. And the main factors that distinguish it from the standard um, in-situ mulch system are the, uh, we started out with ridges, um, or you probably could do the same thing just with a raised bed with multiple rows, but we opted for, um, with these ridges that we formed prior to seeding our uh, cover crop, our winter rye cover crop. And then we planted annual ryegrass uh, down each of those ridges um, and uh, later learned that, that that's called bio strip till. It's a, it's a thing. Uh, and I think it's a pretty cool idea. And uh, we're hoping that we'd get not only get some kind of loosening and preparation of that planting zone, but uh, but that that the 
residue would, would winter kill and, and disintegrate and we'd be left with a kind of a, an easier space to plant into because we don't have any real sophisticated high residue uh, transplanting equipment. Um, in practice, the way that it worked out for us was we have we had a, a large large family of deer spend a lot of time in this field, and they pretty much grazed off all the radish residue and kind of trampled the the ridges and compacted them a little bit. So in the spring, it just it really wasn't something that we wanted to plant directly into without some other way to uh, to suppress weeds. So we ended up just improvising and. We applied about uh, two or three inches of compost right down just the just the row, just the ridge top, and um, that served to to both try to keep weed seeds in that in that exposed soil from germinating and give us a, a loose planting medium to to put our plugs into. <clears throat> and um, overall, there was I think there's a lot of reasons to keep exploring this. There are definitely some some things that didn't work as well as we wanted to. Um, but I think overall, I think this idea of combining the, the deep compost system with an in-situ cover crop mulch is a, um, could, could be an area that we want to explore further, particularly if you're trying to adapt this to, to direct seeded crops, um, because you can't really do that with, with uh, a, a heavy organic residue. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of mention, this is not something I can really speak to with experience because it's a new thing for us, but we, we did get uh, our hands on a, a straw bale processor. We, we co-purchased co with another farm nearby. And um, I, I kind of made this decision a little bit reluctantly because um, I've been really excited about this transfer mulch system, um, but there's really not a lot of off-the-shelf equipment that works for that. So there'd be a lot of, I think, kind of customization and modification to try to make that happen. And, um, and then there's just the limitations of, of needing to, to produce the biomass uh, on site as well. And so with the straw, we can, we can purchase it in from, uh, from another grower if we need to. Um, it can be stored, it can be easily transported around. And so when it comes time to plant and mulch, we, uh, we don't have to, to also be spending some time uh, growing the, growing the, the green uh, transferred mulch. So, um, so I'm, I'm excited to try this in a few different ways. One of which I think it could be useful to, uh, in a system where we'd actually transplant into a winter killed cover crop with somewhat less residue. That's easier to, to get into with our equipment. Um, and then, uh, potentially applying straw on top of that after the fact, um, once it gets somewhat established, either uh, in the way that it's pictured in this this photo here, where it can be banded uh, kind of in, in the in between rows, um, or it can it can be distributed over a you know, 25 to 40 foot wide swath um, and a more of a broadcast system. So um, no results yet, but just I wanted to, to kind of plant that seed as something that we're trying and hopefully we'll have something to re report on uh, next year. All right, and then the, the last tactic that I wanted to go over a little bit is the use of um, interseeding cover crops into established plantings. Um, and we've done this primarily with peppers, so that's kind of the focus. Um, we did get a, a, a farmer rancher grant from North Central SARE in 2019 to do a trial with this. And um, we've found that it really uh, has some, some merits and we've continued to, to use it um, on our farm and it's a good way to get cover crops growing in your field, particularly with long season crops like peppers that often don't leave enough of a window after harvest, after harvest is completed to really get a meaningful cover crop established to, to protect your soil over the winter. Um, so, you know, there's, there are, this can lead to some reduced tillage for weed control. That's not really been our, our primary goal with it. Um, but um, we we found that the, the fruit is cleaner. Uh, it doesn't get as much soil splash, and it's easier to get into the field to harvest right after a heavy rainfall uh, compared to, to to muddy conditions with with exposed soil. Um, and so we've used this both in a, a plastic culture system where we just planted in the pathway, and in a bare 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 ground uh, situation where we just broadcast it over the entire field. Um, and the, the key to making this work is to try to minimize uh, the competition between your cover crop and your cash crop. And um, we, we've had reasonable luck uh, interceding the, the cover crop between plastic mulch beds right around the time of, of 
transplanting the crop. Um, that gives you the maximum kind of ecological benefits from having that growing there and keeping the soil covered and um, producing biomass. Um, but uh, it definitely needs to be mowed regularly through the season. And um, I, in, our, in our experience, there's likely to be a little bit of a yield drop when you have that growing there. But I think with good nutrient management and irrigation management, um, it can definitely be made to, to work pretty well. Um, and then, but more often we ended up just seeding it a little later, um, six or seven weeks after transplanting, um, after we've cultivated a few times, because we do have the equipment to do that, then we'll intercede the pathways and there's usually enough time for that to get established um, before we start harvesting. And then um, that late in the season and with the harvest activity and the trampling, we don't do any mowing in that, in that way. Um, and then when we are growing it in a bare ground situation, we will just broadcast it over the whole field. Um, had pretty good luck six or seven weeks after transplanting. And it just grows, it commingles with the crop. And uh, we try to grow low, low statured cover crops so they don't actually just kind of encroach, uh, encroach on the crop height wise. Um, but seeding it that late, usually we can have good cover on the soil and it, and it, it had a um, pretty negligible impact on yield. Um, so it's still an experimental thing for us. We're still playing around with different cover crop mixtures um, that we, we've done mostly annual ryegrass mixed with Dutch white clover. But um, we're gonna try uh, creeping red fescue this next year instead of annual ryegrass um, because we've found that annual ryegrass will go to seed um, and it can, can become a, a carryover weed seed the following year. Um, and we've done some other uh, experiments with interseeding. We routinely uh, will seed our asparagus fields to either cowpeas or forage soybeans after finishing harvest. So we'll do our last harvest, we'll, we'll mow it and um, do a, a shallow tillage pass and then um, drill, drill a, a really high rate of soybeans or uh, uh, cowpeas. And that does a good job of uh, just kind of suppressing the weeds during the um, the, the growth season after harvesting. And then we did, we did hemp one year and, and I interceded annual ryegrass. I think that was in late August or so. Um, and, um, and so the, the fields ended up with a really nice cover crop going into the fall. Um, so, um, I guess that's, yeah, that's what I have, um, for, for what we're doing on our farm and happy to, um, have this conversation uh, continue here. There have been a number of questions about cover crops and uh, especially which cover crops work best for interceding pathways. Again, our, our experience is mostly been with annual ryegrass and uh, Dutch white clover in a mixture. And um, kind of looking at the literature and, and uh, Sarah has some good, good publications and they give some information about when how those have worked and they were both recommended. And I think I was a little bit surprised when we did our, our trial two years ago with how, how quickly annual ryegrass went to seed. Um, it was probably, I don't know, five, five or six weeks maybe after, after planting. And um, cause we're really looking for short statured uh, cover crops that aren't going to be growing up into our crops that don't necessarily need to be, either not mowed at all or not mowed very frequently. And when annual ryegrass goes to seed, you know, it, it goes from maybe being six inches to being 16 inches. And, and then there's a seed production issue. So, um, you know, I don't know that I would recommend that if you're planning to have it in for a long period of time. In the cases where we've uh, planted it in maybe in August, at least maybe mid-August or onward, um, maybe it's just because of the, the time of, of year and, and certain like triggers that it needs for, for reproduction. We've had minimal to no seed seed production with the annual ryegrass. And it seems like a really good option for later in the season. Um, so yeah, I, I know uh, I've, I don't know how it's been working, but I've seen photos from uh, Harmony Valley farm uh, and they've used creeping red fescue mixed with Dutch white clover. And I've seen pictures of them doing it mostly for, for plastic culture in, in the pathways um, with, with uh, I know I saw a picture with onions and with melons. 
So that's one that we want to try. Um, but I, I don't know that we have, I don't have the perfect recommendation, but white clover, as long as you can control the kind of stoloniferous habit of it, um, seems to be a pretty, pretty good option because it stays nice and short and, um, you know, it's a legume, so it shouldn't be as competitive, but it can definitely creep if you let it. Um, some additional points that people uh, ask questions about for cover crops are to do with mowing, to do with the cost of cover crops, and to do with the place of buckwheat. Um, so any thoughts about any of those issues? A couple of thoughts that come to mind. Those are, that's a pretty general, you know, uh, question there, but um, I, I find that a, that a, fl a flail mower is uh, the best tool for managing cover crops. Um, you can take down a, a very large, tall, high biomass cover crop with it. And uh, most importantly, it, it, it distributes the residue evenly across the field. Um, if you use a, a brush, brush hog type rotary mower, you end up with kind of wind rows with, with maybe more residue than you want and then areas that are bare. So we're, we're pretty happy with a, a flail mower. Uh, cost, the, the truth is I've never given a second thought to it. Um, it's the economics of incorporating cover crops into to high value vegetable cropping systems, uh, you know, as compared with with agronomic crops where, you know, the, the, the margins are, are so they're, they're, they're the value is so much lower. So the thought of, you know, spending however many, you know, 20, 30 dollars an acre to, to seed rye, you know, is a, is a bigger choice. So it's I mean, it's a cost. There are certainly um, cover crops that are more economical. Um, and, you know, I find oats and peas and rye are all pretty darn cheap and you get a lot, a lot of benefit from, from the seed cost. So, um, that's, that's just my personal view that it's, it's, I've never really, uh, never considered, uh, the cost as a big, big issue and, um, buckwheat, we do use buckwheat and it's, um, it's, it's a really, the challenge is, is you get a lot of benefit from the, from, from the pollinator standpoint, we, we do quite a bit of work to, to create and maintain pollinator habitat on our farm. It is a, it is a marvelous plant for a, a wide range of, of beneficial insects and, and pollinators. Um, but if you let it flower for more than maybe five days, uh, then you're going to start getting seed production. And so if you're, if you're using it in an actively rotated field, that's going to be in a vegetable crop next, um, we still use it sometimes if we have a short window of time to fill between a spring and a fall double crop, maybe. Um, but I think, I think it can be a really good component if you have some kind of a, a pollinator strip, you want to have like some annuals in there because it'll self sow very readily. And it's a really valuable plant in a lot of ways. But um, if you're trying to grow it like in a vegetable field and you don't want it to, to create a problem, then I think the benefit is much less because you really can't let it flower for very long. Um, but otherwise it, it can, it's a really good, um, uh, uh, it'll, it'll outcompete anything at the beginning. So um, it's very good if you want to just kind of have a short period of time where, where weeds are kept at bay. Um, and then when you, when you mow it, it, it breaks down to almost nothing. There's not much biomass produced. So it's not, not, I don't think hugely beneficial from the soil health standpoint in terms of building organic matter, but it definitely has a place. Yeah. I should just clarify <clears throat> with regards to cover crops and, and profitability and expenses and stuff. We're in a lucky position to have land, you know, where we're operating on a, a larger farm that my extended family owns. And so we started out with, with 14 acres and we were able to add eight and then we added another 10. Um, so we're, we're kind of building in the ability to, to actually take full, you know, a full year to put it into cover crop um, specifically for, for kind of soil, soil building purposes. Um, I was mainly referring to the, the use of a cover crop, you know, before, between or after a cash crop within a year where, you know, potentially a double, double cash crop can be pulled off uh, in those circumstances. But um, more talking about like, you know, you finish harvesting winter squash on September 15th. Like, is it worth, you know, spending 30 or 40 bucks an acre on rye to get that growing into the fall if there's no other cash crop to put in? In my view, it's, you know, it's an easy yes. Um, but for sure, for folks that are more land, land limited um, or really are facing a real choice between planting a cover crop or planting a short term cash crop, then, yeah, there's maybe more of a more nuance to the decision at that point. 
Dana, I was curious about the kind of seed bed you had after your, um, I think it was oilseed radish in the ridges. How was planting into that? Well, I mean, I, I, di I didn't really get to see what planting into the oilseed radish residue oh, was yeah. like. Yeah, because the because the residue all disappeared uh, into deer's bellies, and then uh, and they kind of just got got trampled. There's hoof prints, and they were like eroded and stuff. So um, we have a deer fence now. We actually were able to build a deer fence last fall, which is amazing. And um, so I think I'd like to try it again. Um, so yeah, we ended up having to, to use that kind of compost technique as a as a workaround. Um, but yeah, there's been some some pretty cool um, work done on. Um, using winter killed uh, oilseed radish, tillage radish um, for spring planted direct seed crops like um, spinach and, and beets and other things. So I think there's some evidence that that, that can, can be a good strategy to plant straight into that with, with pretty basic equipment with just like a double disc opener on a cedar or something. Um, so we haven't tried that, that system exactly ourselves, but um, hoping, to, hoping to try it more in the future. Yeah. I'll pose, first pose the last question uh, to all of you. What do each of the presenters see as the next stage for research and development in no-till? Or put another way, what are the big obstacles and questions that need to be solved with this production system? I'll, I'll admit that when uh, when I first heard about um, the work that, that Jan and Johannes and the rest of their team were, were doing with this transferred mulch system and this mulch cut transplanter, I was like, they figured it out. Like, they, you know, that just, it seemed, <laughs> it seemed like that was like the missing link. And I've spent, you know, so much time trying to think about these dealing with, um, you know, just the mechanics of, of planting through mulches. Um, so from, from a technical standpoint. So I think that that, I mean, I think that that's could be a big part of, of making this system work. I think there are a lot of these just issues with, um, with, with nutrient management and with um, soil temperature. And, you know, if you, if you look at the, the, the research that's been done and, and on-farm trials that have been done over the last, you know, 10, 10, 15 years in these rolled cover crop systems, the, you know, the results are kind of all across the board. And, and until we can start to minimize that variability and, and identify what exactly are, are the causes of those, uh, you know, yield, yield declines, um, in, in a given environment. Um, I think that that's, that's a pretty broad thing. That's, you know, that's what I hoped I would help figure out when I did my, you know, my master's program and I didn't, didn't quite crack that nut, but, um, I just think if we're, if it's going to be adopted on a wide scale, it needs to just be reliable. And, um, you know, I, most farmers that are using it are, are still kind of experimenters, uh, in, in there, in that way. So, um, that's, that's my thought. 